Well, good morning. It is time for us to get started this morning. Appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, before we get going, we uh, have a few things to make mention of. As you know, this coming Tuesday evening is our trunk or treat. Uh, those of you who are involved in it and parking your cars need to be here about 5 uh, five o'clock, I think it is, and it starts at 6. But uh, got a list back up there in the back. If you're supposed to bring something, check out the list. But uh, uh, plan on coming by. They're going to have hot dogs and chili and I don't know what all. It ought to be a, a fun experience. It'll be my first time to do that here at this, this congregation. But uh, it ought to be a fun experience. Uh, we have quite a few people on our prayer list, and I'm going to refer you to the list. I didn't pick one up this morning, but uh, I do know that we want, want to keep uh, Brother Honeycutt in our prayers. He's having a difficult time as far as, uh, you know, he's had his surgery, and uh, every time they get ready to bring him home, something else happens, fluid builds up and what have you, so uh, they, they're keeping him in the hospital want to uh, continue to remember him. Uh, Brother Mike, I don't see him here this morning. That doesn't mean he won't be here. But uh, he wears out pretty quick, and he's recovering from his heart surgery and been having some difficulties. So y'all keep him in your prayers as well. Got quite a few people. I want to give you an update on a friend of mine, Lloyd Lowe. Uh, we made mention that Lloyd had uh, was diagnosed, well, VA. Uh, checked him out. He was having all kinds of problems. Had tumors on his lungs and in his neck and what have you. And they said he was a victim of Agent Orange, <laughs> and uh, he was an old Vietnam warrior. But uh, he's a preacher, was a preacher over in Fort Davis, uh, Texas. And uh, anyway, long story short, they went in there and uh, removed the things in his thyroids. He wasn't cancerous, what have you, but they took half of his lung and uh, because he had a big tumor on it, and it was not cancerous. So uh, Lloyd is recuperating now, praise God, he doesn't have cancer, but uh, he's having a difficult time just getting around, getting used to that oxygen thing. And he says, you know, what's the funny, Ken, is that uh, before I had the surgery, my oxygen level was down in the 80s and I wanted to stay asleep all the time. Now my oxygen level with half a lung gone is 98. <laughs> he says, says, I don't understand that. <laughs> and I said, but praise God for the recovery. And so I ask you all to uh, keep him in your prayers. Uh, Speaking of prayer, let's go ahead and go to our Father in prayer this morning and just praise Him for allowing us to do, be here. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we have this, this privilege and this opportunity in this country to gather this morning and, uh, to study a portion of Your Holy Word and to lift our voices up in song and praise to You and to meditate upon Your Word. Father, we realize that there are so many things that we fall short of, and we just ask your forgiveness for that. But, Father, we truly, we're truly trying to become more and more of what you would have us be. And we realize that as we stand in front of you in awe and, and fear and trembling, that it is you who truly works in us to will and to act and gives us that desire to become more like your children. We thank you, Father, for your many blessings. We thank you for this congregation at Rainbow and for your children around the world. But we pray for those here at Rainbow and we just ask you to wrap them up in your love. Those who are struggling physically and uh, having health problems, we, we pray, Father, as we commit them to your care that you would reach down your healing hand and take care of them as only you can. We ask you, Father, to be with us now as we study your holy word in the book of Philippians from Paul's letter to that church there. Help us to truly understand what it means to rejoice and to be happy uh, in this Christian life. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Speaking of rejoice, you know, that's what the book of Philippians is all about, rejoicing and uh, joy and uh, just, just being happy. That's what Paul is getting at. And it, it's mentioned a lot in there, but it, it, sometimes it seems like there's difficulties going on. And uh, Paul is telling these people what you need to do is not only be joyful, but what you need to do is let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then he goes into this whole exposition about what that manner of life involves. He gives us the picture of Jesus the, uh, the, before the, the pre-incarnate Christ in all of His radiant glory and how He strips Himself of that glory and puts on the form of a man and comes down to this, this earth and lives that sinless life and uh, is obedient to the Father even to the point of death. But then God raises him up. And 
uh, glorifies him in heaven and uh, gives him a name that's above all names. And because of all of that, we need to let our manner of life be worthy of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes it's difficult to do that. We live in the good old United States of America. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm, I'm pretty proud to be here. <laughs> Out of all the countries on the face of this planet, I'm glad I was born in this one. Uh, I know you people from Alabama, I love you to death, but I was born in the great state of Texas. <laughs> I didn't get to be as big as I should have been. I think it's because I moved. And, <laughs> and so I didn't get my height, but uh, I had uncles that did. That was a good thing. But here in the good old United States, we live in what's, what we would call a land of plenty. And uh, as we look around this auditorium this morning, I see people who are dressed well, and ladies have their jewelry and all this good stuff on, and the men are well-groomed and, you know, have on good, good expensive shirts. What do you mean expensive? I got mine at Walmart. Hey, Guess what? <laughs> there are people in this world who don't have shirts. There are people in this world who don't have anything. And even our poorest in the United States are better off than the poor in other countries. When uh, many years ago I was in Seattle, Washington, and it was probably about 5 o'clock in the morning. And if you've ever been to Seattle, you know it rains and it's foggy all the time. And uh, I was sitting there out in front of a, or behind a Red Lobster restaurant. And I saw a man coming through the shadows in the fog. And he was dressed in this grimy looking dungaree jacket. And uh, his tennis shoes were about the color of my shoes. I mean, they were black. He had long hair and a beard and he was oily and greasy and looked like he hadn't had a bath in three, six months. And he goes over to the garbage cans behind the Red Lobster. And he takes a garbage can lid and uses it as a tray. And he's picking through the garbage and he's finding crab claws that people left meat in. He's finding cheese biscuits. He's finding leftover fish that people had not eaten. And he puts them on this tray and he begins to eat. And that made me sick. It really did. But you know what? At least he had a dumpster to go diving in. There are people in other countries who haven't got that. I'm haunted by a picture that I've seen uh, over the years. As a matter of fact, the gentleman who took the picture committed suicide. And it's the picture of this little infant boy trying to crawl and the buzzard or the vulture is sitting there over the top of him waiting for him to die so he could feast. Well, this happened over in Africa. You know, in Somalia and all that where there's starvation is going on, people have nothing to eat. We truly live in a land of plenty. However, if this thing's going to work, yes. We talk about prosperity. And this, we, we are prosperous. Uh, look, People say, we don't make a lot of money. You know, I'm just on welfare or SSI or whatever it is. You got that, all right? You, you slept in a bed last night, or if you slept on the floor, at least you had a roof over your head with, uh, you know, sheetrock or paneling on the walls. You, you had something uh, to keep you from out, being outside in the elements. Uh, yesterday morning, a man knocked on my door, and uh, he was over at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is right across the street. For some reason, they didn't have a meeting yesterday. And he got there right before daylight, riding his bicycle. And he was dressed in a parka, and uh, he was soaking wet. And he just asked me, he says, are they going to meet today? And I said, uh, they're supposed to, but they never showed up. And he was a street person. But you know, he had a parka. He had shoes. Had a hat on his head. Had clothes on his back was able to travel from one place to the other on a bicycle that he had gotten somewhere. <laughs> okay. But the point is, even our poorest are prosper compared to people in other countries. And wealth is something that we just measure. 
uh, on, on scales. Uh, before I retired, I was probably doing the best I've ever done in my life financially. Okay, really, the church I worked for really took care of me and took care of Nita and uh, just gave us a great deal. They loved you to death over in Louisiana if you let them. And uh, I got to thinking about that one day. When I first started preaching, I made, I think it was $175 a week. Wow. And I had to pay my rent, pay for three kids, pay all the utility bills. And uh, it, it was tough, but we did it, right? When Nita and I got married, I think I made $2.50 an hour. I had more money at the end of the week after I paid all my bills than I do now. <laughs> you, know, you know, think about it. We, uh, we, we got married and uh, we, we bought a house. The day we got married, my car got totaled. I had a 63 Impala convertible I was in love with and a drunk hit me in the right rear corner panel, sent me spinning down the road, and I wound up with a 68 Volkswagen. That was one way to start a marriage, right? Should have told me something, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, we had new furniture, bought his fingers furniture, had the house. We ate steak. Matter of fact, we could go to Monterey House three times a week if we wanted to. And I had money left over. We could go fishing in Galveston or whatever it was. But the point is, wealth is on a sliding scale. And you might not be as wealthy as you want to be, but you're more wealthy, you, you have more wealth than somebody else in this congregation, more than likely. And, and when we look at that, this society of ours breeds discontentment because we always want more, don't we? You always want a little bit extra uh, for what it's worth. Remember the Rolling Stones back in the 60s? I can't get no satisfaction. That has become the theme song of many people in the society today. I want it and I can't get it. Therefore, that makes me upset. And then we get bombarded by things like the media. You turn on your television set, and I don't care if you're watching, uh, you know, PBN, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, I don't care what you're watching. After a little while, you want to spurt blood out your eyes. <laughs> because of all the stuff that's going on. And there's always negative things. Everybody's talking about what's wrong with the world or what's wrong with Russia or what's wrong with politics or what's wrong with, uh, you know, some, some city in the South or what, what's wrong with everything. And television is, is terrible. What happens on TV is nobody pro has problems. Everybody on the television, you know, they all wear good, well, let's see, let me think of a good show, uh, or show. <laughs> I don't watch, uh, man, I can't think of anything. Does that mean there's no good shows? Think about this just a second. In, in, in television, everything is glamour and glitter, right? On the internet, you pick that up and you start looking at all the comments on Facebook during the political season or what's going on in the world or the NFL, what they're doing and all this other stuff. And then you have, you know, the radio, the talk show hosts really talk about the negative things. Newspapers, that's a joke nowadays, but, uh, you know, newspapers just don't print anything news. I quit taking a newspaper in New Iberia when the headline was uh, the police arrest a man in uh, Lauraville. Louisiana, for cutting hair on a Sunday. That was the top news. And I quit taking to Iberia, daily Iberia. You know? uh, magazine, same thing. Okay, You're bombarded with all this stuff. And then the advertisements say, you can be better. Ladies, you, you've seen these advertisements for uh, all the makeup and L'Oreal products and the hair conditioning products and now they've got this this thing out and Nita says it's about this big kitty and it get rid of the peach fuzz on your face. I said just use my electric razor. <laughs> you know, <laughs> same difference. G guys, I, all of you are fishermen or most of you uh, go fishing. And you know, you go down and you buy, buy some hooks. Those hooks are going to cost you three, four dollars, right? Have you looked inside your wife's makeup kit? One jar, $18. One little tube, $7.95. Their makeup kit is worth a fortune. 
if you could take that thing and, and convert it back into money, you know, you, you could go out and eat it, for, you know, steak and ale or whatever it is, you know. You could, you, you could do that. And it, it, it costs, as a matter of fact, I think that the makeup kit costs more than about six, uh, six car payments when you finally figure it down to it, okay? We try to get everything that we can. And society gives us this idea of plastic perfection. You're always striving for it, and you never get there, okay? Long introductions, <laughs> all right? The elusive dream of personal happiness. Everybody in this room is searching for it, and you've been searching for it, and you're going to continue to search for it. Some of you were born back in the 50s. Some of you maybe a little earlier. But I remember the 50s. As I was a kid growing up, it was nothing to put on my Roy Rogers cap gun and my cowboy hat and go play in the backyard until the dark and mom started calling me in. And if I didn't come by the third time, I was in a lot of trouble. Anybody remember playing marbles, guys, in school? They don't do that anymore, Right? We played on a playground, and if you got hurt and got a cut, you rub some dirt on it and keep going. You know, that's the way we did things. I remember listening to the radio when I was a child. I'd listen to Ren 1010 or Inner Sanctum or The Shadow Nose and things like that. And I'd gather around, sit around that radio and listen to Lone Ranger. And my imagination would run wild. That was our entertainment. Then we got a television set. Nine-inch screen. Rabbit ears with tinfoil on it. And Dad said, hold it right there. <laughs> you know? But that was it. And it would go off at midnight. And they'd play the Star Spangled Banner when it signed off. And then the next morning, come back home with that Indian chief on that test pattern. Remember those? That's the way it was. But we grew up. Bob Dylan's old song, Times They Are Changing. And the country I live in today is not the country I grew up in. The society I see around me today is not the same society that I've always had. As a matter of fact, nowadays, kids very seldom get outside. And the things that they play on, uh, look, <laughs> the, the, the Xbox, that costs more than my first living room suit. You know? Uh, the, the furniture I had in my house wasn't worth as much. And then, once they figure out the, the you know, the, the, the uh, little games in there, they have to go buy another one. Why? Because that one's no good anymore. It's no good. It's no good. And it's, it's a never-ending battle. And then, we're no, adults are no different. You know, we try to figure out, what wall am I going to have to tear down in the house to get this in? We always want something more. It doesn't make any difference whether it's a television set, a new car, uh, and there's nothing wrong with wanting a television set and a new car, but that's not what's going to make you happy, okay? Kids today, bless their little hearts, <laughs> you know, if you had fun, you won. Participation trophy, right? Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody's a winner. That's not the way it was when I was growing up. Second place meant that you were the first loser. That's the way it used to be. But nowadays, everybody is going for more and more and more. Vince Lombardi, some of you older folks might remember him. He says, if winning isn't everything, then why do they keep score? I believe that, <laughs> all right? And so we need to remember that as we go through this, that there's something happening in our society. And sociologists tell us this is the problem. The problem is we've gone from large families to small families. And you say, well, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that in a large family, the children competed with one another for the attention. They competed with mama and daddy to, if they were going to get something, they'd have to compete with three or four others in order to get it. Nowadays, in a smaller family, the parents are the ones who are competing. The child is the one who's in control. You know, reasons for decline in marriage, that happens today. And, uh, you know, it, it's, people are married at a later, later age. But the big problem is, let me back up here, 
it's people are choosing not to marry. They remain single or they cohabitat. Uh, the family size has decreased. Now that was an old statistic, but the, f the factors are the same. Women's employment, the cost of child care, and lifestyle choices. That's why families are smaller. Put somebody in child care, see how, long, how much that costs. All right? If you've got three, four, five kids, <laughs> you can't afford it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> when I was a kid growing up, it was the parent who called the shots. Nowadays, got so many children who are calling the shots. Go to Walmart, stand around and listen sometime. Okay? <laughs> really, the age is there. So why have I said all this, okay? Why have I said all this? It's because today we have this mentality of people who think that everything needs to be given to me, and if it's not given to me, I'm upset, okay? And that goes for if you're breathing air. Somehow or other, we've assimilated a little portion of that, okay? And people become disillusioned. Remember Heath Ledger? Some of you younger people might remember him from Batman movie. He committed suicide. A couple of weeks after he did that, he won an Oscar for playing a part. Remember Robin Williams? Committed suicide. And you don't have to be rich to do that. I, uh, you know, to say, I'm sick of trying, tired of uh, sick of crying, tired of trying. Yeah, I'm smiling on the inside. I'm dying. That's the way people feel. They put on this facade. And they look at the world and it just makes them sick, okay? You know what God says? About time I got there, huh? <laughs> James 5, 9, don't grumble against each other, brothers. You'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Don't be grumbling about the station in life. 1 Peter 4, 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Oh, they're coming over again. No, don't do it that way. So God all throughout the Bible tells us we shouldn't be grumbling, but it started off very early. You remember in Adam and Eve over the Garden of Eden, what happened? Adam didn't want to take the blame. He says, you know that woman you put here with me, she's the one that gave me that apple. <laughs> you know, she's the one that did it. And then it passed on to the children, Cain and Abel, after he killed him. Cain says, oh Lord, you, you can't do that to me and send me out because it, it, that's too much punishment to bear. Uh, you're driving me from the land and I'll be hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me is going to kill me. He's complaining. Moses was complaining about the exodus. He returned and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Is it why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak your name, he's brought trouble on this people, and you haven't rescued your people. Moses complained to God. Okay? Over in Psalm 105, 24 and 25, then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his promise. They grumbled in their tents, and they did not obey the Lord. God was doing everything for them, and they were grumbling. They were fussing. How often do we do the same thing? Romans, the ninth chapter, verse 6, it's not as though God's word has failed. Jump down to verse 15, where he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, or for this reason, God has mercy on whom He wants to have mercy, and He hardens whom He wants to harden. Look at the next verse, 19. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? Now this is the Israelites. Why is God still punishing me? Why is He doing this for what they did? Why does God still blame us? Who's able to resist His will? But who are you? A human being. Who are you? a human being, to talk back to God. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? In other words, God made you who you are. And He has a purpose for you as you are. And you don't have the right to grumble about it. What? No. Who are you to talk back to God? Why me, Lord? Why is this happening to me? Well, <laughs> you are where you are because God puts you here. I was born July the 30th, 1945, because that's where God wanted me to be. I wish that I'd been born back during the Mountain Men era. <laughs> 
I'd have made a good mountain man. Didn't happen that way. Didn't happen. He had me born in 1945 for a reason. And he had me move to 405 King Street for a reason. That's where that woman right there moved in next door. He's had me all through my life. And I've wondered, God, why in the world did you bring me to this place? And the reason being, because God's teaching me a lesson. Okay? Who am I to do that? You know, there's a biblical principle that we all need to understand. Failure to willingly and joyfully submit to God's providential will is a deep, serious sin. Huh? Yeah. God's in control of your life. Now, Paul says, be joyful. Okay? If you'll remember, <laughs> in chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, uh, thir uh, 12 and 13, he said that you're to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, with awe, fear, trembling, terror, you know. And that's your part in sanctification. But then you have the second part of it where it's God who is working in you to will and to act. And if God's not working in you to will and to act, then all your fear and all your trembling without God is not going to get you to heaven. Next thing Paul starts talking about is complaining. He says over here in Philippians 12, verse 14 through 16, this. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in, uh, or labor in vain. A couple of things we're going to look at. Don't have time to get through all of them this morning, but this idea of doing everything without grumbling or arguing, we're going to look at that this morning. And the reason being, we'll talk about next week, it's so that you can be blameless, become blameless and pure children of God living in this generation and shine like stars. You know, we talk about being little lights. <laughs> this little light of mine. Paul says your little light's as big as a star. Think about that. Am I shining a candle or am I a bright light in the world? Okay. You see, if I am shining like a star, then I illuminate everything around me, right? Darkness is way out there, but too often we find darkness right here next door, don't we? Because we're not doing it the way God wants us to. I'll be able to shine. And then <laughs> I like verse 16, the latter part of it, then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I didn't run for labor in vain. <laughs> you see, you need to stop the grumbling and all that so Blake can be happy. <laughs> what? Think about it. How would you like to get to your end of your life? Here I am, you know, I'm 72. Uh, preached for 45 years. That part of my life is over. And sometimes I look back and say, did I make, it, make any impact? Did I do any good? Did God use me to bring people to Christ? Am I a failure or was my ministry worthwhile? Blake, you're going to do the same thing. There's going to come times when you're up against the wall beating your head saying, why do I do this? And you know why you do it, because there's a fire in your bones and you've got to do that. But how we respond affects how he's going to grow and you're going to grow, <laughs> you know, how we do that. Okay? So, let's get into it. Do everything, verse 14. That do everything is pointing back to verse 12 and 13, where it says that, uh, you know, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's pointing back to that. And part of how, working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, well, let's back it up. The negative attitude for salvation is grumbling and disputing, okay? <laughs> Don't be doing that. <laughs> and the positive attitude is rejoicing the Lord always. Be happy rejoicing in what God's doing, okay? Remember that. All right, do everything. <laughs> Gugusmos, another one of them $40 words. <laughs> we translate it as grumbling. Literally what that means, it's a negative response to something unpleasant, something inconvenient, something disappointing that arises and that response arises from a self-centered notion that it's undeserved. This doesn't need to be happening to me. Why did you do that to me? Do you understand? Why did you say that? that that's what we're talking about here. It's an expression of dissatisfaction, grumbling, complaining. 
Oh, man, when you talk about complaining. You see it all throughout the Bible. You have, remember over in Matthew 20, the hiring workers in the field, and the, the, he agreed to, to, to pay them a denarius, and so those that hired first, they expected to receive more than a denarius because the 11th hour worker, that's what he paid them. <laughs> when they received that one denarius, they began to do what? Grumble. Huh, this ain't enough. Anybody ever look at their paycheck and say, this ain't enough? <laughs> so, I, I, I used to do that. I went from hourly to salary. And my hours doubled. Paycheck didn't. <laughs> okay. This ain't enough. And you'd fuss about it, okay? Uh, you, you go a little bit further and you find the Pharisees, they complained about the disciples of Jesus eating and drinking with the tax collectors and the sinners, the harbatia. You know, sinners <laughs> complained and grumbled about what they're doing. I can complain and grumble about what Jimmy does all the time. I'd have to make something up, but I can do that, right? I can complain about, you know, I've been sitting over here for so long, I probably ought to be sitting where Jimmy's at, but he won't move. <laughs> you know, we can complain about things like that. Uh, then, then the Israelites, you know, they were grumbling and uh, they kept grumbling and some of them were killed by a destroying angel. All right? People are different. You know somebody who is like this, somebody who is always complaining, always grumbling. Nothing is ever right. All right? Uh, he, <laughs> I'm not picking on you, baby. <laughs> you missed a spot. Right? Did you cut that backyard yet? You see, there are people who look at things and all they see is the bad. There's an old saying, two men look through prison bars, one saw mud, the other saw stars. It has to do with your perspective. I can either look for the good things or I can look at the filth. And if I look at the filth, nothing's going to make me happy. Stop the grumbling. Stop the complaining. Stop the bickering. Stop wanting more. That's not me saying that. That is God. Stop the complaining. Stop the grumbling. How do I do that? Well, focus things on things above. There's a thing called stinking thinking, right? And stinking thinking can ruin your life. You will never be happy. You will be depressed. You'll wind up feeling like you ought to be like Heath, Heath Ledger. You know? Sometimes you just want to check out. You'll never feel good. You'll always have a bad headache. Your pulse will always be racing. Why? Because you're always finding fault with something. Stop the grumbling. Grumbling, dissatisfaction, complaining all the time is sinful. <laughs> Diglosimos or diaglosimos. We get our word dialogue from this. And the, the, it's translated disputing in, in this passage here. And it, it's actually the questioning or doubting or disputing the truth of a matter. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. The truth of the matter. Romans 14, 1. Except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Wouldn't it be great if we could do that in the church? Now he's talking to the church. Quit disputing things. You know, later on we're going to find two ladies, and we're going to get to them, I promise, before the quarter's over, Yodia and Syntyche. And I don't know what the problem is. They're fussy. Uh, they're, they're at odds with each other. It could be a mother and a daughter. It could be two friends. It could be an aunt and a, whatever. A anyway, Yodia and Syntyche are fussy. And, and Paul is talking to a fellow. Well, he, King James says yoke fellow. All right. You need to rise up and help these two ladies get along with the word yoke fellow is Syzygus, which is a proper name, by the way. And he could be saying, Syzygus, you need to help these ladies. You know what kind of position that puts old Syzygus in? You ever tried to get between two women who are each other's throats? 
I'd rather get into a bar brawl and try to stop that, <laughs> okay? Because there's no reasoning. Emotions take over. And when emotions take over, guess what? Satan is prompting over and over and over again. We need to remember that. So when, when a person whose faith is weak, there's a fellow, Jesse Duckworth, in my first ministry in Cleveland, Texas, first full-time ministry, Cleveland, Texas, a hundred and some odd years ago, Jesse came up to me, Brother Wright. Yes, Jesse? We got to stop that boy from coming in here. Why, Jesse? Look at his hair. See how long it is? This was in the 70s. Look at his long hair. It comes down to his shoulders. That's a sign of effeminacy. Really? Now, the same passage of Scripture that he's going to says if a woman has short hair, let her go ahead and be short. And guess who had the shortest haircut in that congregation? Sister Duckworth. It's back when pantsuits came out. Remember pantsuits, ladies? I'd rather see a woman in a pantsuit than a miniskirt any day, to be honest with you, okay? Brother Wright. It's an abomination for a woman to wear man's clothing. Really? <laughs> you, would you wear that pantsuit, Jesse? <laughs> you know, when you get down to it, there are people in a congregation who look at things differently. Do we ridicule them? No. Do we beat them up? No. What about the person who, is, who has problems with the Lord's Supper being right before the sermon. What? I came from a congregation that many years ago, we had the Lord's Supper after the sermon. You know why we did that? I think it was because a lot of people take the Lord's Supper and then go home. <laughs> we wanted to make sure they got a sermon out of it. You know? <laughs> so, but, you know, that's just the way things were. But you can ridicule people, and what happens when you do that? Church is split. Don't they? Okay. First <laughs> Timothy 2 and 8, In every place I want men to worship with holy hands, lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. We can't lift our hands. <laughs> yeah, you can. What? That's Pentecostal. No, it's not. It's biblical. You're saying raise your hands? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying if somebody does raise their hands, you don't have the right to put them down. Uh, in New Iberia, we were multicultural, <laughs> right? And we had a congregation down the street, Anderson Street. It was our black congregation, our black brothers. And we had a lot of black brothers in our congregation, half and half, okay? But every now and then, they'd come over just like today, and, and their style of worship was different than our style of worship. I sat up there be preaching one day, and I didn't know who these people were that came in, and they're hollering, amen, and I changed my sermon, and I'm preaching right at them. And they kept saying, amen, 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 you know, and I wasn't used to that. But boy, I tell you what, it was for turning me on. <laughs> and after, after we, we, we had the invitation song, I'm sitting there and somebody's tapping me on the shoulder. And I turn around and there's this great big brother standing here and says, Brother Wright, I'm Roy Williams from Anderson Street. Can we use your baptistry? <laughs> boy, I felt about this big. Yeah. I misunderstood everything, you know. Why? Because it was different. And by the way, saying amen to a preacher is like saying sick him to a bulldog. Right? Okay? Just thought I'd tell you that. Now they raise their hands, they say amen, do all this good stuff. Hey, works out fine. All right. <laughs> Grumbling and complaining, disputing. We can do that all throughout our lives. We can do it in the congregation. But when we do it, understand grumbling is an emotional thing, disputing is an intellectual response. It's all sinful. All sinful. Philippians 1.29, it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for Him. So when you're going through a tough spot in life, realize that God's got you going through it to teach you a lesson. Praise God. Learn from it become like that star in the universe. Next week, I'm going to talk, talk about reasons to stop complaining. I'm done.
Thank you.